Hi folks, welcome to another video here on the channel. Um, today's video is uh, quite a very different video than I normally play on this channel, but uh, I felt um, that I had to share this here because uh, this is directly related to a lot of the things um, <laughs> that are happening in the world right now, let's put it to you that way, and... Um, this is one of the videos um, that I had shared on my other channel called Waking Up the Sheep. If any of you have never gone over to that channel, you could click in the About page here on my channel here on DoorDash Sucks Channel. Click on the link to Waking Up the Sheep and that'll bring you, bring you to my other channel. The other channel I ran for over two years. It's, it's still up and running. I just haven't posted anything there in about five months, four months. And even when I had this channel, I really didn't share that immediately with the channel because I guess the community wasn't ready to hear it and um, kind of been spoon-feeding you folks that have been willing to listen, that have ears to hear and eyes to see. Now, this video that you're going to see is not meant to scare you folks. Don't get in fear and be scared, especially those who are Christians, because we know what who wins the, the war and the battle at the end, right, Jesus? But this is for people who may be on the fence and don't understand things and may not believe in things that are going to happen or going to come to the world. And um, this is meant to, to open your eyes, wake you up, so you start following what God wants you to do, what his plan for your life is, okay? Many of you may reject this, and some of you may cling to it, and it's going to touch your heart, and you're going to change things that you need to change in your life, and all of these things, right? Remember, I'm just a messenger, folks, and um, also I also love each and every one of you here on this channel, because you're all brothers and sisters of mine, and what brother and sister, or what brother would I be if I didn't share uh, the good news and the gospel of Jesus, and the things that are coming to the world? Now, one final thing I'll say, you know, you guys and gals, I mean, you must watch TV and hear the news about the war in uh, Russia and all that stuff, what's going on, okay, and you've heard stuff about China, okay, <clears throat> and things that are going, like, that the world is just upside down, right? So it's war, uh, rumors of wars, wars and rumors of wars, right? And that's told in, in the Bible, actually. But uh, it gets it gets more than rumors, folks, um, eventually. And so you need to be prepared for these things. And um, this message is here to help you. Now, the link to the full video will be in the description that will lead you over to my channel to watch the full version of this video. And I highly, highly encourage you to watch the entire um, the entire video. That's going to be up to you whether you want to see it or not, because there's way more information in that video than there is here. It's detailed. I edited this down. I also took out the um, the intro to my channel in here from my other channel uh, with the music and stuff as far as the full uh, two minute intro to my videos over there. So this is the type of stuff that I that I do over at that other channel. Um, and I guess the Lord had put it on my heart to do this channel and kind of ease this into you guys so you would, you know, see the reality of things. One last thing I'm going to say here. Look at where we are in 2023 right now as we stand. Look at where your life is. How, you know, how good is your life going? Are you, are you good and plenty? You have everything? You got lots of money? Are you struggling? What's going on, right? You go into the stores, you see sh food shortages and all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, prices of food are very high. There's lots of layoffs coming, okay? The video you're going to see was by a man named Chuck Youngbrandt. He died a few years ago. He came out with the, this prophecy this information in 1999 but he was given those visions in 1972 and then leading all the way up to you know when he died 
The reason it's interesting is because when you hear what's in this video and you look to see where we are now in 2023, it's going to make a lot of sense to you. So please don't take this video lightly. Don't take the messages lightly because it's critically important, especially for your soul going forward, because we're, we're born and we have to die someday, folks, right? And this life is very short. So at the very least, give this video a look-see and a view through. It's only about 34 more minutes from this intro. It's, it's a short version of the full version. Like I said, the links are in the description. But I felt as though um, you needed, to, you all needed to see this, okay? Um, you'll be thankful in the end or down the road that you listen to this information because when the things happen, you'll you'll understand why you were able to see this. And I give all honor and glory to God because he put it on my heart to share this on this channel with you. So with that said, I'm going to play the video. Please watch it through and please go over to the link in the description after you have seen this, this 34 minute video and go over and watch the other video when you have time. Cause the other video is like two and a half hours long or two hours and 38 minutes, but it's real important. Okay. So if the spirit leads you, remember the spirit is willing, but the f flesh is weak. Remember that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Don't be weak. Stand up and seek out the Lord in all his ways, okay? All right, folks. That said, let's move on to the video, and I'll catch you on the next one. Take care. I start off with this, Christ, Prophet, Church, Relationship. It's important for you to understand something here. Jesus will reveal to his prophets in visions and revelation by word what's coming. The prophet then goes to the church and presents that revelation, that word, that vision. But very often these are not predictions of things that are inevitable. Very often they are warnings of things that can be averted, altered, or changed. If the church believes the prophets, if they pray or repent and pray, the judgments can be modified, mitigated, even canceled. If they do not believe the Lord's word by the prophets, if they do not repent or pray, then the things the Lord warns will come to pass with certainty. And I've seen it go both ways. I've seen where the church has prayed and the judgments have been mitigated, lessened, contained. I've seen it where they have been ignored judgments have fallen and many died. So the relationship between the church and the prophet and the Lord is very simple. He gives us the word, we give it to you. You make a decision. And if you made the decision, he'll send the prophet out to prophesy in the decision of the church. And we can't do any better than what you do, though we might want to. April 2nd, on January 2nd, 1978, when I was abiding in Christ, Jesus spoke to me and said, eight flags will fly over the Americas, and the U.S. flag will not be one of them. Eight flags. We know Russia, Red China, and Japan will be three of them. Dmitry Dudeman saw Mexico, Cuba, and Nicaragua. Serbia is a possibility, because I saw Serbian troops. Well, actually, some other Christians saw Serbian troops in near Atlanta. This map, which I have to pull up here a little higher. This shows, by the way, when the thermonuclear attack hit the United States, everything south of Orlando, Florida sunk. The impact of the thermonuclear attack caused that peninsula to break up and sink into the sea. It was very gentle. I saw the vision of it. The water just came up and covered and was gone. This shows the areas, the father's circle with his finger, 
northern uh, Florida, northern New York, central Arkansas, northern Dakotas, northern Washington State, where he said I will keep many alive here. This is the last area of the United States. These are the invasion routes the Chinese and Japanese will follow and the Russians from over here. This is the destruction area in the Midwest from the earthquake, the big one I talked about earlier. This little spot right there, that's where the, the president will be at in a salt mine. The government will resort to being in the salt mine. I saw the invasion, I saw the conquest, I saw the occupation, and I'll be talking more about that, and uh, praise God. I know Christians, and one Christian named Ellard in Ontario, Canada, who told me, he called me after hearing this revelation, that one day he was plowing his fields. He's a, a potato farmer, he calls himself a French fry farmer, because his potatoes are used for French fries in the United States. He told me that he was plowing his fields and he heard this rumbling, roaring noise, and the ground was shaking. He looked up and the sky was filled with planes coming from the north going to the United States. And there are Russian transport planes. That's how they get a million men here. He said there were at least three deep, almost wingtip to wingtip, huge planes, cargo planes. They'd fly them in in the invasion. The actual, the people that invade will seize air bases. Then the planes will come in and bring the troops, and then tanks, artillery. They're going to use uh, Philadelphia as a supply base. The Russians used neutron bombs, killed off the population of the city that way. We saw that in the vision. Praise God. I saw the Chinese doing terrible things. They killed everybody in Los Angeles and San Diego. Men, women, and children, everybody. They simply dug, dug big pits, put the people in there, and buried them alive. They were killing everybody in sight. They intended to exterminate everybody in this country. Then God did something which prevented them from doing it, and they changed their policy. But they're not friendly by any means. Japanese landed up at Astoria, Oregon. It was interesting because I saw a tape by Henry Groover. By the way, this was published in 1979. I saw a tape by Henry Groover where he talked about the invasion. And he saw Oriental troops landing at Astoria, the same place the Lord showed me, 1977. I called Henry and I said, yeah, the Japanese. He said, how do you know? I said, I heard him speaking Japanese. I tried to learn Japanese. It didn't succeed. But uh, that's how he knew it. These others were diversionary, a question mark. I'm not exactly sure where they landed. The troops landed and deployed inland, causing a lot of confusion as to where the main invasion force was taking place, which was Slaughter Beach. This is a fascinating thing. This has been published, it will be published, and other Christians will know it, and yet our armies won't know where the main invasion force comes. They won't know. They don't believe. But if they believed, they'd be waiting for them on the beach, and it wouldn't happen. They'd be waiting for them on the beach, it wouldn't happen. But they won't believe. Sad. The church has been warned, but they won't believe either. You do. Most of you do. Amen. Praise God. So the message is for us. God's going to be with us and bring us through. Amen. Amen. On April 21st, 1977, Jesus spoke to me and gave me basic outline of the judgment coming on America. I've broken it down to three periods, first year, second year, third year. He started out by saying, do not buy an air conditioner, get used to the heat. Do buy gas cans and store white gas. Spring rain will be followed by summer heat and gas shortages. The dollar will begin to slide in July. For this reason, crude oil imported to the United States will increase sharply and there will be gold value problems. Temperature rise will begin in early June. I asked the Lord when in June. He said June 9th. And climate temperatures reaching peak highs in July that will hold all the way through to September, followed by sudden and drastic temperature drops in October. There will be no rain of any significance from mid-June and on. Japan and China will become friends through economic agreements this year. And in 1977, towards the end of the year, Red China and Japan signed the first economic agreements. What was going on? The Lord was showing us, <clears throat> we were seeing what he calls shadows or early patterns of the judgment emerging. 
that were not the fulfillment of what he was talking about, but it was an evidence saying to the church, this is not going to happen in some distant time, 100 years from now or 10 generations from now. It was coming in our time because we were seeing the early evidence of it indicated it was going to come in our lifetime. And Jesus said the church will continue as before. The angel of death awaits throughout this year. What did he mean by that? The church had been rejecting his word all along. And he was saying that when this judgment was, begins to surface, they will continue rejecting his word, even though the evidence will be obvious. The angel of death, what does that mean? He showed me that the angel of death would go through the church and reap a vast harvest among the rebellious and disobedient, killing 90% of those people in that church system. 90%. Only a tithe, 10% would actually survive. The Lord said, do not fear. This year, many will lose jobs in city and state governments will fail suddenly. There will be serious economic crumbling. Then the Lord gave me Psalm 37, verse 39. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord then said, disease will start from California and move east. Many left incapacitated. Again, we saw a shadow of this. In 1983, AIDS started in California, moved east across this country. But that is still not the fulfillment. It was only an early warning pattern of even worse to come. Then the Lord said from Georgia, a plague to kill thousands as it spreads. Panic and fear will grip the nation. Food riots will break out in August in many major cities. Food costs to soar, availability declines, quality poor, hoarding magnifies the problem. Government tries, but fails to instill confidence. Those who rebel against God will also rebel against government and hundreds of thousands will want for food and starvation begins. Then the Lord gave me Psalm 37, verse 25. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. <clears throat> Heat is unbearable, no rain. Multitudes curse God, but those touched by the love of Christ will repent and God will spare them. Psalm 53, verse 1, the Lord gave me. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none that does good. And the Lord continued, power outs caused by heat, fuel shortage grows worse, riots and deliberate destruction by enraged individuals and extremist groups aiming to overthrow the government. The Lord gave me Proverbs verse three, verse, I'm sorry, Proverbs three, verses 25 and 26. Do not be afraid of sudden panic or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence. He will keep your foot from being caught. Local police will fail to deal with the violence. The state troops will be called out. And in some areas, the violence will be so severe that federal troops and tanks will have to be called out. The Lord gave me Psalm 125, verse 2. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people. At every step of the way, the Lord is giving assurances to his people. He's with us. He's not abandoning us. He'll be with us and bring us through. The judgment is coming on a nation that's turned away from him, not on those that stayed with him. In the second year, January, northern Iowa will be struck by a strong tremor. Thirty days later, a massive quake will strike Boston area, followed by a wave of quakes leveling blows clear across the land. In 1979, the Lord told me that there would be a tremor in Iowa on March 19th, 1979. And there was. Very modest one, so minor it was hardly registered, but Christians felt it and reported it to me. We counted 30 days later, came to April 17th, 1979, and a 4.1 Richter earthquake struck Boston. The strongest earthquake they had there in 10 years. Again, we were seeing shadows of the judgment he was talking about. This was nowhere near the intensity of what he described in his word, but again, shadows. What is he trying to say to the church? Pay attention, this is real. This is not going to go away. I'm coming here 20 some years later, and I've seen the judgments in the last 20 some years increase progressively get more and more destructive. And I've seen a very interesting pattern in the church. The more destructive the judgments get, the warnings, the more the church ignores them. <clears throat> my prophets will be sent out across the nation with my call to repent in late spring, saith the Lord. Psalm 37, verses 27 and 28. Depart from evil and do good. So shall you abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and he will not forsake his saints. Little winter snow, but intense cold and little heat in most American homes. I repeat that. Little heat in most American homes. This is going to be a nationwide problem. Many of the things the Lord spoke of back then, I couldn't understand. 1977, where were the computers? There are hardly any computers. He was showing me an outcome. And this is going to be a factor in the picture here. In some places, too much snow, in others, none. Severe winds add to the cold. 
power is diverted to major institutions, hospitals, entertainment centers, they'll be rationing electric power. Food lines and economy near collapse. The United States crude oil imports cut off by most oil producers. Japan becomes Red China's ally. Chicago temperatures, minus 40 to minus 46 degrees below zero during the coldest temperature of the winter. Here in South Bend, you know what that means. If it's that cold there, it'll be that cold here. Upwards of 80% of homes in the Chicago area will be without heat. After a month of intense cold, many will freeze to death. With little food, intense cold, and fear everywhere, life will be intolerable to those who do not know Jesus. Suicide will become common. He showed me that plainly. City services will break down and fail in midwinter. Fires will burn unchecked. The dead that fall in the streets will lie in the streets. Disease will flourish and kill tens of thousands. The nation will reap the seed it has sown in itself. Some people say this is a punishment. I say it's consequences. Ignore God, reject Christ, turn from him and sin. It's consequences. Not God's purpose for us, but it's what's going to happen if we keep going this way. So the Lord gave me Psalm 147, verse 6. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Over half the nation's employed will be without work, and the dollar will be worthless. Half the people that have jobs will lose their jobs. Canada will be in sad shape, not as bad off as the United States. Mexico and Canada will seal their borders and set a quota of how many United States citizens can move over. Winter will end abruptly in April with warm days and sunshine. It will be very pleasant and many will think it's over, but the land is parched and last year's crop failures will deepen this year. Rivers and lakes will dry up this year and temperatures will rise to over 120 degrees by mid-May. Other areas will be ripped by numberless tornadoes, hurricanes. Waves of tremors will shake the land, followed by outbreaks of disease and fear, hate, spawn, destruction. Famine will continue. The government will establish a special economic arrangement and food distribution program. But early crop failures mixed with unending disasters will crush all hope. Corruption in government will destroy confidence. No rain, intense heat. People will stay indoors in fear. Everything is failing. Only the Christians have the strength to act in the hand of God will be clearly visible to all in the Christian communities. There will be miracles of all sorts. Food will be multiplied, the dead will be raised, the sick will be healed. You'll see wonders of, of the sort we've even dream of now. Many will be saved in this time, but many others will curse God, knowing full well why this has befallen them. This will be the year of fear, pain, and misery for those who reject Christ. The Lord gave me Psalm 149, verse 4. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with victory. Sin will grow to its deepest, even in the midst of judgment, with a call to repentance the loudest, with visible signs and wondrous miracles, and the mercy and love of Jesus reaching to all. Multitudes will reject Christ in knowing ways, and the depth of depravity and abominable behavior will stun even the most compassionate. Persecution will also reach a high in this year, and in many states with government approval. Jesus said, my prophets and messengers will be abused and hated and injured and killed. The wrath of God was much blended with God's mercy, but now the wrath of God will burn hot. His fury will be unleashed in a terrible way. The Lord gave me Psalm 125, verse 3. The scepter of wickedness shall not rest upon the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands to do wrong. The giant earthquake strikes the Midwest. Literally the whole continent is shaken by the intensity of the earthquake. The Midwest United States is devastated. The Russians and Chinese have been formulating contingency plans to deal with the United States, aiming at long-range wearing down to the United States the required close cooperation. Although they review the possibility of war, neither power wants to risk war until there's no risk. Both agree that the United States is not to be taken intact, but to be destroyed after weakened. The massive Midwest earthquake happens at this time, and with great excitement, they both see that the United States' defenses are down. It appears to be the opportunity they've looked for under the guise of helping us to recover, they immediately begin to set in motion a plan of attack. Thirty days later, after the Midwestern United States earthquake, the Lord sends his angels to warn his children to flee. And seven days later, Russia and China press the buttons, launching a full thermonuclear attack on the United States. The U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Forces are death, death blows. Major cities are destroyed. The United States returns a hard punch at Russia, much to their surprise. <clears throat> but, weather, but Russia weathers the counterattack with strength and within two months invades the United States. In an address to the Russian people today, Vladimir Putin claimed he's developed a new arsenal of weapons that the U.S. cannot counter. These include a nuclear-powered cruise missile, a hypersonic missile that can strike anywhere, and a nuclear-powered underwater drone. Russian President Vladimir Putin says that he got nuclear weapons 
that are invincible. And that the nuclear arms race is back on, threatening to turn tensions with Washington into a new Cold War. We are in this environment where both Russia and the U.S. are introducing new weapons. To the American people, this administration's highest priority is your safety and security. The new nuclear policy came out uh, on February 2nd and the Pentagon called for the introduction of two new types of nuclear weapon delivery systems and mainly aimed uh, at Russia. Putin actually said that it was a response to that. So the question is, are we in this environment where we're back in an arms race and both the US and Russia are going to be trying to introduce new capabilities to pressure one another? The main thing that Putin said today that's important is that it's a cruise missile, it's not a ballistic missile. Um, and cruise missiles, they hug terrain and they, they travel very quickly and, and so that makes it very hard for defenses to protect against them. The fact that Russia is putting new threatening cruise missiles um, into their arsenal uh, makes, makes it much harder, of course, for the U.S. to defend against them because we have very limited defenses against cruise missiles full stop, whether they're nuclear or not nuclear. And one of the things to keep in mind is that the genesis of U.S. missile defense systems was in the Cold War era. And the initial idea was that the U.S. could build some sort of giant shield that would protect uh, against all the Soviet missiles that might hit the U.S. homeland that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies. But after the collapse of the, the Soviet Union, the U.S. reoriented its missile defense program towards rogue actors such as Iran and North Korea, kind of giving up the idea that we would be able to protect the United States against, uh, or needed to protect the United States against a full-blown missile attack, and instead focusing our efforts on could we shoot down one, two, three, a handful of missiles that are coming from North Korea at the United States. Uh, Putin is, is saying that these new missiles that Russia is developing uh, would be able to penetrate U.S missile defenses, there's no way that U.S. missile defenses would be able to fend off a full-scale attack from Russia anyway. Russia has thousands uh, of missiles, including intercontinental ballistic missiles. They could launch more missiles than we have interceptors. The way we prevent uh, a full-blown confrontation like that with Russia is by having a nuclear deterrent. The sort of flip side of are we in a new arms race is what is the future of arms control? Are we going to be able to come up with a new agreement with Russia? Are we going to be able to build that trust and have the diplomatic power to get there? Um, and right now there's, big, there's a big question mark over that. Praise God. This, this point is where I left off before. The invasion, the United States, and the occupation. The occupation will last seven years. At first it won't be terribly bad. Matter of fact, in the areas where the Russians are at, it will actually be fairly good. The Lord showed me that Christians will actually have a sense of being liberated when the invaders arrive, especially in the East Coast areas. Why? Because we'll be under a terrible demonic oppression from the Antichrist system in this government. So when that system is torn down, we're actually set free. That's before, of course, the occupying armies settle in with the, the officials who are not so kind. I remember seeing in the East Coast an aircraft carrier where the captain had been ordered to surrender his aircraft carrier, one of ours, took it out and scuttled it and was laying in the mud, half sunk on its side. These visions were pretty sad when you, when you take a look at them. Russia will annex uh, Alaska and kill everybody there. They'll kill off the whole population. Uh, Hawaii will surrender to Japan. The president will then, of course, flee to uh, the area of Kansas in a salt mine. The government will go underground. And the United States Army will fight to the last. There'll never be a surrender. They simply tear a flag down, occupy our country, the army will flee to the hills and continue fighting in guerrilla fashion for the next seven years. The times will be so hard, the Lord showed me the children will be sold for food. <clears throat> this is not pleasant, but we're looking at cannibalism. And the Lord made it plain this would happen. During the occupation, towards the end of it, I saw something even more horrific. I saw this. First of all, the towns and cities that were occupied by the occupying armies the populations tended to cooperate with the armies that were there. And I saw churches that had the crosses removed, and in a place they had a bust of Karl Marx. They were worshiping Marx as if he were Christ. I saw this in the vision plain as day. It, to me, it was like, <laughs> I couldn't understand that. Around these towns and cities, I saw witches, warlocks, and homosexuals who gathered together and hunted Christians for food. 
Christians were in the outlining areas, basically fending off the attacks from the occupying armies and the attacks from these uh, nightmarish people living around the towns. Towards the end of the seven years of occupation, the enemy is going to call, set up a program called re-education camps. They basically are aiming to eliminate Americans, period, kill them all off. I saw people being taken on passenger trains, the trains were running, and they're shipped to areas where they're moved into cattle cars, the cattle cars to factories. And the factories, they're basically stripped naked, hung by their heels, and processed for food. It's like cattle. And this is what brought the wrath of God and his entrance into the picture. Jeffrey was raised up, and the, um, the occupying armies were driven out, and this was ended before that was processed any further. Terrible? Storing food. How many here are storing food? Quite a few. And others aren't. And you should be. One of the things I talk to people about is, well, either you got a Moses anointing or a Joseph anointing. Now, if you got a Moses anointing, you don't have to store food, do you? Because manna from heaven will come down and feed you. Or if you have a Joseph anointing, you better store food. But how do you know which anointing you have? That's the question. Don't assume you got the Moses anointing unless you know it. So I've come up with a very simple test to kind of make it easy. Take your shoes off, take your socks off, fill your bathtub with about a foot of water. If you stand on the water, you've got a Moses anointing. <laughs> if your feet hit the bottom, you've got a Joseph anointing. Now let that settle the problem and end the debate. Praise God. I talk about the church a lot, and the church is, is a, both a blessing and a problem. And people say, well, can you define the church? You're talking about a specific church, a specific denomination. And I usually say this, whomsoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as his or her savior makes up a part of the church, no matter what denomination they're in. And I've seen Christians in every denomination, and I've seen those who are in denominations who aren't Christians. We've all seen that. My definition of the church is those who know and love Jesus. Now, not all have Jesus as their Lord. I believe most here do. But, praise God, all those who are saved make up the church. People also have asked me, should we fight the occupying, the enemy armies when they come in? Well, if the Lord God has given us into them, their hands, how can you possibly prevail against God? Don't do it. You'll get killed. It's as simple as that. If the army can't stop them, it's got tanks and artillery, do you think you're going to stop them with a pop gun? I don't think so. One brother one time, he said, oh, he got himself this big rifle and he's going to shoot the Chinese. I said, yeah, sure he will. I said, you'll set up your hill, you'll take a couple of shots at them, they'll come up with a big artillery piece and blow you away in one blast, and that's the end of that. No, God has said he's given his hand into the hands of the enemy. He's got a reason for it. Don't resist that. Don't resist that. And don't fear it either. The Lord's with us. He'll bring us through. Praise God. I saw Russia invading Iran, and I knew by the Spirit of God our military is going to be destroyed in this war. Our army will go over and not come back. They'll all die. There'll be a few spared, a few will come back, but they're not being in great shape. Then the Lord said, come, there's more. This time I saw North Korea invading South Korea. I saw Japan shaking. I saw Taiwan being attacked by Red China and actually invaded. And then I saw the Philippines turning blood red. Now what I knew was our military was stretched so thin we couldn't cover. These things are all happening in the same year. War in the Persian Gulf, North Korea uh, is invaded South Korea, Red China invades Taiwan. Our military can't cope with it. They're stretched so thin they can't meet the threat anywhere. We try to meet it in the Persian Gulf area where the oil fields are at and our army is destroyed. Then the Lord showed me this. This will also happen. I saw the three volcanoes exploding on the west coast, as Stan has mentioned. And he says, the Lord said, continue praying as you are. This will have the greatest effect towards obtaining mercy. Obtaining mercy. That's what the church is all about. Don't pray for judgment. Pray for mercy. Pray for God's help. Pray for his love to be shed out on all men. Pray for salvation of the unsaved. We don't need to pray for destruction. It's going to come all by itself. But the church is in a position to stand in the gap for many and save many before these times fall. That's why we're in the cities now, not only as intercessors, but as witnesses for Christ. Don't run to look for hiding places. The Lord will take us there when it's time, and not before. 
If you try to get ahead of God, you're going to be in trouble. The Lord's warnings are often warnings of things that can be changed. Now, in 1984, the Net of Prayer, which is part of the ministry I'm part of, and a friend is here who's the leader in that ministry, but in 1984, we recognized that Russia, the Soviet Union, was planning on taking the United States with nuclear weapons. They're going to put them in Cuba and launch them from there and hit us real bad. Now, we knew that war was going to happen, and I knew from what the angel had said in 84 that unless it was changed, the world was going to end in 1984 for us. So we began praying and asking God to destroy the weapons of war. We wanted to kill any Russians. The Russian people are just like us. They're, they're not bad people. Matter of fact, they're kind of nice people. And so let's get rid of the weapons of war. Blow up their missiles. Destroy their ammunition. They haven't got any bullets. They can't shoot you with them. Okay? So we prayed that way. We asked the Lord a little thing. We said, Lord, when you've answered our prayers, please cause a Russian submarine to surface somewhere with the missile compartment smoking. The reason we did that is we wanted to get on to praying about other things, you see. And so we didn't want to overdo it. Once it was done, we'd say, praise God, thank you for answering our prayers, and go on to the next thing. So on, in April of 1984, a Russian submarine surfaced and deceived Japan with its missile compartment smoking. And it was, uh, I think, on the cover of Time magazine at the time, as I recall. And uh, we knew that it was done. Then this article was published in May. Shermovsk, the main missile depot for the Rush Soviet North Fleet and a major ammunition depot, blew up. The explosion was so massive that it looked like a nuclear explosion from outer space from a satellite. There were six other major explosions in uh, Soviet ammunition depots. It denuded the North Fleet of all the ammunition they had for the next almost two years. It took them that long to replace it. That ended the war. Christians praying in agreement, unity in agreement before the Lord, and the Lord blew the place up for us. That date, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and that triggered the Gulf War, which put us into the mess we're in now. Why? You see, in 1989, earlier that year, the Lord showed me Lucifer. I saw him talking to his princes, and he was saying, they don't know what we've done in, in Iran, in Persia. They don't know what we're up to, what we've got plans for them. And I asked the Lord about that, and the Lord's angel spoke to me and said, Persia, 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 many will come and fight and die here. And this is going to be our undoing, because this is the war that I showed you earlier in 83. We're going to get involved in there a second time, and this time we're going to lose. It's going to be bad. This is a deadly trap. The Lord showed me in 1989 and 1990 that we shouldn't get involved in this war because we couldn't get out of it. I said, we're going to win and go home. We're still there. This is 1999. How many years has it been? How long will it be before we get out of there? And we seem to get deeper and deeper into it, don't we? This was a trap. The trap the Lord spared us for many years. Now we're in the trap. And our nation is not going to be extricated. People say, can this judgment be changed? Can it be canceled? No, it's too late. In 1988, Jesus spoke to me and said, henceforth no longer call my church to pray. Henceforth tell my people, repent or die. The judgment set is going to come. You ask me when, I don't know. I do know this, that we're in a mercy period right now, which will end in August of the year 2000. After that, the judgments are going to intensify and get worse. How much time we've got, I don't know. But I do know one thing, that if you're praying and watching, the Lord's going to show you what's coming, and you'll be ready. Okay? Now, what I shared with you tonight is pretty complicated, a lot of detail. But we're talking about a major earthquake striking September before, two years before the big one will come. We're talking about an accidental nuclear attack that will be preceded by a hurricane in September. The accidental nuclear attack will come December. Two years later will be the thermonuclear war and the invasion of the country will follow. The Lord has provided us with enough evidence that if we watch the season and keep our eyes open and praying, we'll see it coming. But in the meantime, we've got time. Time to do what? The will of God. Praise God. And also, remember this, brothers and sisters. Jesus gave us a commandment, love one another. Not a request, by the way. A commandment, love one another. There's a lot of things that can cause separation in us and doctrines and views and opinions, but don't let these be a barrier. We are all in Christ. We all love Jesus. And Jesus loves us, and we should all love one another. And as we're united in love, then in that fellowship, we have authority, and through authority and prayer, we can do many things to save many. And that's what our job is. We're here to help others. We're here to bring them out of the trouble they're in and into salvation if they'll accept it. And that's our job. That's our call. That's our joy. 
Some of you did not have great father figures. Some of you had fathers who passed away before they could give you a blessing. Others of you, for one reason or another, are unable to receive a blessing from your father. To you, I want to offer the blessings of the Heavenly Father through myself, an earthly father. This type of blessing is seen in number six as God blessed the children of Israel under the pronouncement of Moses. It goes on to say that upon blessing the people, God would place his name and bless those who heard it. That means you. Therefore, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And from me, from my heart, as a father and a grandfather, I'd like to bless you in this way. May you reach the purpose for which you were created. May you have courage above your peers. May you have more passion for the things of God than others think is necessary. May you dream more than others think is practical. May you expect more than others think is possible. And may you choose wisely without earthly bias. You have people to influence that you've not yet met. You have lives to change that are waiting for your arrival. You are strategically placed wherever God takes you by His grand design, just so you can become everything He made you to be. That place is the place you can grow best. That place is the place where you can be most fruitful. The place where the future is changed because of your presence. May you see vistas that others don't even know exist. May you see God in every petal of every flower and every blade of grass, for each of them are designed by His hand. May you bless your children, and may they become giants in the faith under the mighty hand of God. You won't fail. You were made by God to be here for such a time as this.